It seems that we all want to be finished. It seems like um, there's a, that along with this urge to find some way to get free of the feeling that life isn't what it's cracked up to be, it is accompanied by a sense that that we want something that'll be finished, that there'll be some event that occurs that finishes everything, settles everything, reveals everything, clarifies everything, and then we're done. Uh, we're at least done having to try to figure anything out. That's a kind of magical thinking. You know, and especially in, in uh, activities that, that uh, have as their objective <clears throat> a, some profound change in our relationship with life or our relationship with reality or our relationship with ourselves, there's an idea that, that at some point I'll be finished. And that's the end of it. And then everything will be as it should be. Nothing will change. I won't be disturbed. No, you know, ripples of, of uh, confusion or frustration or discontent will ever trouble me again. That's crazy talk, really. What we're talking about here is life. And the truth is that life is never finished. As long as you are alive, you will not be finished. You will be finished when you die. Until then, you're not going to be finished. Every day, every minute of the day, there will be some newly, some, something seen in a new light, or something that hasn't been seen before, or something that hasn't even been suspected before, that will appear and um, cry out for your understanding and for your engagement and for your, you know, uh, doing something about it. That's life. That's the way life is. Life is endlessly surprising. It is unreliable. It's unpredictable. It's difficult. And, uh, and there you are. <clears throat> the urge to be finished is part of the overall urge to go back to sleep, to return to the womb. The urge to be finished is to be finished with this life. Because that's the only way you're finished, is to be finished with this life. As long as you're alive, you'll never be finished. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, uh, oh, hi. <laughs> and like life, this work, this approach to um, reconciliation between me and life itself is never finished. There's never an end that where everything then is in some um, approved and stamped and clarified, this is the truth, this is not the truth, this is what you do, this is what you don't do. This is brand new in the world, and it is alive, like you are. It's alive, this work, this approach, this magical thing that has occurred here. So, it's our... The, the other thing that we... we um, that I talk about endlessly, is that we, we seek some kind of safety from engagement with the rest of the world, especially safety from engagement with other human beings. There's a, there's a, um, a kind of an unnatural uh, shrinking that occurs in, the, in response to the fear of life, in response to the unsatisfactoriness of life. An idea that I am special, I am something in particular, I am something in particular, but I'm not special. I need not be isolated from, from the rest of the human community 
in order to be free of the misery that comes from the fear of life. And yet, and yet, it is... I, 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 I'm not going to say universal, because I don't think much of anything is universally the case, but it's pretty close to the universal impulse especially in the search for a solution to the fundamental problem of human life, to think that the only way I can get free is by closing up into myself and paying particular attention to the endlessly particularity of my experience of my body, my mind, my thoughts, my relationships, and so forth and so on. There's a natural, I say natural, what I mean is an ordinary inclination to protect my vulnerability and my confusion and my ignorance from exposure to the rest of the human community. I want to be together. I want to be closed. I want to be finished. All part of wanting to be finished. I want to be finished and I don't want anybody to know if I'm not finished. You'll never be finished. Get used to it. You'll never be finished. There'll never be a time when you say, Ah, oh, at last, home again, at last. Never. Things will throw you. Things will pop up and surprise you. Your own thoughts will surprise you. Because, you know, really they're not so much your own thoughts as just thoughts. God knows where they come from. And in this work, too, you know, and this is something that, uh, that it took me a long time to see, but in this work, too, the understanding and clarification of what we're doing here will never be finished. Never. The, the, the exploration and the, the experimentation and the, the looking at things and fi finding new clarity about things that seem to be settled in the past is always going on in the community of people that are involved in this work. Always. So that if you come to this and you find some satisfaction as a result of having rid yourself of the underlying fear and antagonism toward life itself, you, and you run away, and you know, I've talked about this, the impulse to hide, to go and hide, to get away, not to be disturbed, not to be disturbed by the mass of ignorance that seems to be constantly pouring out of the sky on you. But if you do that, you'll probably be okay, and you'll probably get through your life okay, but my God, what you will miss. You, you know, you'll miss the... We have no idea what's going to come of all this. More, more people join every day. More people come forward every day. More people are posting in the forums, people we never heard of. People who hear of us second and third and fourth and fifth hand from other places, from other websites, from other all kinds of things. All of them being, bring a fresh, a fresh point of view to what is um, the wonder of this work. The, really, the wonder of this work. And everybody that comes brings a fresh point of view. Everybody that comes adds to and clarifies the the body of understanding that's already in place and underway and developing on its own. I cannot stress enough the importance of community, really. There's nothing that, it is second only to the act of looking itself and the importance to the, the, the potential for full engagement and enjoyment of life as a human being because you're not alone. You are not alone. You are in this mess with every other human being on the planet. Every other human being on the planet. 
You're not alone. And if you, and as I said, it's possible, especially once you've rid yourself of this curse, it's possible if you have the money and the wherewithal and the, the skills and so forth to do so, to withdraw from society, to find a her hermitage somewhere, to shrink into a corner and watch the, watch the trees as they, the leaves blow back and forth. And that's certainly an edifying and glorious uh, thing to do. But in the meantime, the human creature is forever finding freshness and new clarity as to the, the really, God, I wish I could, I wish I could find a way to say what I'm trying to say. Human, the human creature is like nothing else that's appeared on this planet. This human creature, not you or me, or, but us. It's like nothing else that's appeared on this planet. For one thing, we can talk to each other. I mean, really, we can talk to each other. So far as I know, certainly not to the extent in the, with the, the uh, range of, of uh, things that can be communicated. No other creature on this planet has the ability to talk to each other. They can bark at each other. They can let each other know that they, oh, I don't know, they want to get laid or they're hungry or, or they're hurt or things like that. They can communicate, but they can't talk to each other. Maybe dolphins can, but I doubt that their language is anywhere near as developed and, and exquisitely um, complicated as ours is. The ability of us of speech is just, it's like, it's like a miracle. Speech is powerful. The ability to communicate to each other and to try by means of words to communicate really difficult and profound and subtle experiences and understandings and clarifications is, it's a miracle. I, uh, I, you know, I talk about the forums at the, at the community center, at, at the website, and every day I read the postings in the forums. I actually am the, the one who approves every posting that's made in the forums. So, and I do that because I want to read everything. I want to because, and I want to read everything, and I want to hear everything, because I want to hear what everybody has to say. Because that's where I get what I have to say, is from what everybody else has to say. And every day there's new people. And every day there is a kind, you know, today I was looking at some postings in the forum. I kind of uh, uh, didn't have time to do it yesterday. I was looking at some postings in the forum today, and it's really remarkable. People come, they do the looking, they have a bunch of ideas and thoughts about what they've done, they have a bunch of ideas and thoughts about what the outcome will be and how the course of it will progress and so forth, and they fearlessly, they pop into this forum full of strangers with a, in a, in an approach to human life that is new and unfamiliar to them and start talking about what they see and about what's happening to them and about what the effect of the looking is on them and what they think is happening and what they think will happen. And then the rest of the people in the forum, most of whom of course have been there, have been in the work longer than the newcomers, the rest of the people in the forum start answering them and responding to them, and explaining from their own experience what happens. And there's this, this um, rich fabric of conversation and communication 
that I feed on. When I come to talk to you, I am fed by that community of people revealing to itself and to me what is actually happening in this work, rather than, for example, what I think should be happening, or what might be happening, or any of that thing, what's actually happening in this work. And I see it as alive. Just like life, it is not finished. The understanding of what we're doing here is not finished. There is no one to come to who has the entire clear light of final understanding about the nature of human life and, the, and what needs to happen. There's nobody like that here. We've somehow or other failed to find anybody like that. <laughs> it's the community. From the very beginning of, of Carla and my efforts to find something useful to do in the world of, of um, the search for uh, satisfaction and fulfillment in life 14 years ago, from the very be beginning of it, it was very plain to me that everything that I would, that the only way that I could come to an understanding, I knew I had something I wanted to say. I knew that. And I knew that I didn't see it being said anywhere else. I knew that too. What I didn't know was what it was. So that for all of those 14 years, I have come to meetings like this with people in the beginning where I would have the usual setup, you know, with a couple of chairs and flowers and pictures of teachers and, and things of that nature, and would sit in silence and, and talk about stopping thought and, and, uh, and all of that. But, but from the beginning until now, I have seen that it was conversations with people that would reveal to me what was happening and what needed to be said, and how in the world to somehow say what I saw to be the case when I couldn't find the words to do so. I knew from the very beginning that it was the conversations with people like this that would reveal that, and not me sitting in a corner somewhere, you know, I don't know, doing whatever people do when they sit in the corner and get enlightened. And that's the truth, and it's still the truth. What the, the nourishment that I get from this time with you guys in this retreat will carry forward for the rest of the year and inform what I have to say to people for the rest of the year and inform my ability to hear people for the rest of the year. These retreats are a great gift to me, a really a huge gift to me. So what I'm trying to get at here is this. <clears throat> the full engagement with the adventure that we find ourselves on here now, whether, you, whether it is you as an individual or whatever, the full engagement with that adventure is to be found only in conversation and communication with everybody else who is involved in the same adventure. And that's a growing community. And there will never be a time when I come to you, or I hope anybody comes to you and says, okay, this is it, we can close the book, we got it figured out, everything is clear now, so go on about and do this, 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 and everything will be right. Just like life. This is something that's occurring within human life. And just like life, it's never finished. There's never a time when it's going to be done settled, wrapped up, tied, put a bow on, and put in a drawer. And we need you guys, all of you. You guys here, you guys who are listening in the future, <laughs> some future time. Yeah, those guys right there. <laughs> we need all of you. The human, the human experience of life is not adequately represented in any individual human being. Really is not. The human experience of life is adequately represented 
in the, the collective experience of all human beings. And the more of us there are, the closer we get to a, a, uh, a full engagement with the experience of being human. And the more we, we decide, okay, I'm okay. Uh, I, bye, see you later. I'm okay. I'm going to settle down. The more th- that's taking away, diminishing the, the, the possibility that's available to us here. It's never finished. And it's, it's all of us, not just you, and not just you, and not just you. It's all of us together. And if you go to the forums, you'll see that. You'll see something happening that I don't think you'll find anywhere else. The honesty and the, you know, you'll see threads where that have been going on for six or eight months, started by people who were come and were deeply confused and, and uh, disturbed about what was happening to them in the wake of the looking. And you see the way in which these, um, the way in which people, as a result of these communications, the ability to freely say what they see to be happening and to freely hear from others who are longer on the path than they are, what to expect and what things look like. You see people changing. You see people freeing up. You see the loosening and opening of the, of the uh, claustrophobic isolation. So I, I just in case you didn't get that before, community is key here. It's not, not individualized, it's community is key. And we have all kinds of things happening that are pretty exciting, so go and look. One other thing I want to say something about, briefly, I'm not going to have much to say. <coughs> The act of looking itself, the actual act of looking itself, is insignificant. It's really of no consequence once its job is done. And its job is done in the first moment that you do it. There is nothing to be gained. (coughs) I'm sorry. (coughs) There's nothing to be gained or lost, but there's certainly nothing to be gained from thinking that there is some particular way of experiencing the looking that's right and other ways that are wrong. There's nothing to be gained from trying to perfect and, and clarify just what it is that this looking is and where do I experience it and what does it feel like. It feels like you and it's not very interesting. It's really not very interesting and although I can report, and others have reported, that there is a, a, you know, a kind of sweetness to it, but very faint. It's nothing to go back to. It's nothing that calls you to go back to. The point of you being here is not to use the apparatus that has, has somehow, I suppose through the normal processes of uh, of uh, natural selection. There's no point in using the capacities that have come to us by by whatever route they've come, the special capacities of human beings. There's no point in using it to try to find out more about what I feel like because you're here to find out what's going on out there. That's what you're here for. You're not here to to rest in the heart of your being or to rest in the simple sweetness of being you. You take birth to be in the world. You take birth to be alive as a human being with human interaction with the world. That's what you're here for. You're not here to withdraw. You're here to go outward. 
You're not here to go inward, you're here to go outward. The inward looking needs to be done just once. I mean, you can do it as often as you want, but it needs to be done just once. And what that does is not somehow protect you from the entire wildness of life as a human being. It makes it possible for you to engage with the wildness of a human being, a human being, in an intelligent and sane manner, in a manner that's wholesome, fruitful. I mean, that's the truth. It's obvious. We look outward. There's no place to look except outward, unless you could torture yourself in order to rid yourself of this disease and bend the beam of attention inward by brute force, because that's what the looking is. It's a bending of the beam of attention by brute force in a direction that it was, is not naturally inclined to go. So the looking is a medicine. It's not a refuge. The looking is a medicine. It's not something to understand what you are and who you are. What you are and who you are is simple beyond words. There's no understanding to it. What you are is you. Just that, you. Who you are is you also, I might add. Now, I suppose who you are might be the psychology. <clears throat> so, I think it's very useful and, be, and be, it will be helpful to people to just don't pay so much attention to the idea that the looking is something that needs a lot of attention. The looking needs to be done only once, just once. And it doesn't even need to be acknowledged that it's done. It just needs to be done once. And from then on in, what's of interest is not what's in there. What's of interest is what's out here. The thoughts, the experiences, the sensations, the, the involvements, the relationships, the, the, the visual, wonderful visual uh, ex <laughs> experience of vision, the experience of community, the experience of, of, uh, of uh, even conflict, you know, conflict isn't that bad. You know, you have an idea, I have an idea. It's a, it is a, a, a ex, extremely satisfying experience to be able to, to uh, bring these two conflicting ideas together and see what we get from that. It doesn't require killing one another. It doesn't require anything. But that's where the richness is in human communication. That's where the richness is in the communication between uh, human uh, consciousness, human awareness, and the magnificence of this world that we find ourselves in, in its endless variety, in its endless storms and peace and wind and rain and sunlight and clarity and oceans and water, water. I mean, what a thing is water. Really, and water, what a thing that is. It's natural that, well, no, it's not natural. It's ordinary to think that, and, and it's, it's what we do for the most part. It's ordinary to try to find refuge internally, to find refuge by closing the doors to the world, by peeking out and being, you know, actively censoring what comes in and what's allowed and what's not allowed. That's what we've been doing all our life. And we've been doing it unconsciously. We've been doing it at the, at the, to serve the needs of the fear. That's what we've been doing all our life. What the looking does is eliminate that necessity, the necessity to protect ourselves from life, the necessity to worry about what, 
well, what is it that I feel like, really? And where is it that I can be found? And what does it mean? And, and am I doing this right or am I doing this wrong? You can't do it wrong, truly. You can't. If you try, you will succeed. And it doesn't matter whether you know you've succeeded or don't know you've succeeded. And if you participate and stay connected with the community of people who are actively engaged in this adventure, you will see that for yourself. You'll see that because of the confirmation that comes from the variety of people who have experiences that are coherent with one another, that are congruent with one another. Not the same, but that fit in the overall what is expected in this work and this approach. And that's where you find nourishment, and that's where you find continual um, confirmation of the reality of what's happened to you. Not by sitting alone somewhere. Not by worrying about it. I mean, you can worry about it if you want. It won't do you any good, but it won't do you any harm either. But not by that. By, by engaging. Engaging in the world. Engaging in the world of human beings. And don't make a big deal of the looking. You know, if you, as I, I said this morning, something about think of it as an antibiotic. Think of it as an antibiotic. When you take an antibiotic, you don't go back thinking about the antibiotic and wondering about, well, wait a minute, was that, is that, is that what I should be feeling after taking the antibiotic, or should be, should I be feeling something different? You take the damn pill and you go to bed and drink some water and get better. Okay? Okay, I've, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> so it's your turn. This is an amazing adventure we've, we've embarked upon here. This really is. This is not like something that's happened in the past. We don't know what's going to come of it. We really don't. We don't know what's going to come of it. But we're going to find out. Okay. I'll just sit here for a while until somebody wants to talk to me. There we go. <laughs> that was easy. Hi, how are you today? I'm doing good, John. Good. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. i got this little allergy thing going on, but that's okay. Um, there's something I'd like to talk about, and it's uh, mindfulness training that you covered this morning. Yeah. But um, before I go there, I want to stumble through using some words to try to convey something. Okay. Um, That's what I do. Um, I walked in to this retreat knowing almost zero about you. I, I went to one talk in September here at the Ojai Retreat mm -hmm. on a Sunday afternoon, so I heard you talk and uh, I talked with you. Um, and what I heard and what I experienced was very refreshing. My first mentor along my life's journey um, appeared uh, in 1975. And it's somebody that I know that you had a connection to. I'm not really sure how that connection was. And that was Chugam Trungpa. Trungpa Rinpoche? Yes. yes I, I, he was my first teacher. Same he here. was dead, I think, by the time I found him. But he, uh, and I still have great respect for him. Well, he was my teacher uh, as of 1975. And what he did in his life he said it as many different ways as he could, but he refused to acknowledge a separation between spiritual and secular. Right. And for the lack of a better term that the public can understand, he had some kind of a mind transmission and uh, then wrote it down afterwards. And uh, he considered what he wrote down, which was pithy and short, 
to be uh, the essence of ever all the trainings that he'd ever had. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was his heart's desire that that be communicated to a world that needed the essence of that. And during the remainder of his life, the next uh, 12 years, uh, he tried different ways of creating models to help that happen. And um, the condensed pithy teachings that you offer on being human are what he tried to accomplish. Because uh, it's nothing that you have said in this retreat is any different than anything I ever heard him say. It's just you're saying it your way and it means the same thing. The, um, the exposition, you mean. The embodiment of fully being human mm -hmm. and appreciating right. that in nowness. And, and that's really what we're talking about is how to, to have that happen as a genuine experience in people. And when that does, all of the speed and the aggression and the fear aren't present, aren't contaminating situations and people. And um, it's something that it, you can talk poetically about it, but you don't need to because it's just genuinely being human yes, and the right. goodness of that in the present moment. And um, I laud you for your ability to convey that in such a pithy, clear manner. Um, I can't find words enough to tell you that. Um, I honor you uh, and respect you as much as I can another human being for what you've done. Um, now going on to what I want to discuss, <laughs> thank you for enduring that. I know it's hard to hear stuff oh, like that, okay. okay? But uh, And there's nothing to say about that. It's just my opinion, Yes, I um, but I'm allowed to have that. You're allowed to have that. <laughs> thank you. Um, relative to mind, fullness training that you took the, us through this morning. Um, you mentioned sometimes, oftentimes, people get lost in their thoughts and they go away and they don't know how long they've been away mm -hmm. uh, or they didn't intend to go away and then they become noticed that they've been away and you said to label that uh, distraction and then just to replace the attention back where it was originally. So I'd like to create a reference point. And it's at that first noticing that they've been away. And that is a nanosecond moment of experience. Right. And so I guess for all the participants and everybody that hears this, I'd like to just reference that nanosecond. Because in that nanosecond that we experience that we are gone. It happens faster than we can say, oh, I'm gone. <laughs> yes, right. It, it, it's a true nanosecond of genuine experience that's also referenced as pure awareness. And um, I think that everybody has the opportunity to appreciate that awareness that's non-conceptual because it's non-conceptual experience. It happens ever so briefly, but it's, it's, a, um, it's something that we can hold on to. That and moment of noticing. That yeah. moment of noticing that's non-conceptual, that happens faster than you can say noticing. You know something. <laughs> it, it, you actually profoundly know it, yeah. and it's experiential, and yet it happens in a, this, not, without using a word. There's this core knowing. Right. That knowingness is what I postulate that is the same in all of us. That's our core humanity. It's the essence of being human. That's you, actually. Thank you. That's, that's you. That's using your vernacular. That's the you that you reference, that knowing. Yes, that's that right. That happens that's in a you. nanosecond that we get to experience that's and that we have the potentiality of um, experiencing it more than just as a nanosecond. The less we're in our th identifying with our thoughts, the more that we can identify with that knowingness. Well, there's some truth to that. I, I think that uh, 
first of all, I, I agree with you that that moment, that that uh, nanosecond, nanosecond, uh, nanosecond is putting too much measurement on it. I think, <laughs> but that that nanosecond is a direct experience of your actual nature. That's what that is. Thank you so much. And some call it knowingness. Some call it awareness. Some call it all all kinds of things. Lots of names. The, the problem with all the names for it, other than you, to begin with, is that they are abstractions. Even you is an abstraction, but it's much closer to the bone than knowingness. It's the simplest abstraction I've ever heard. Yes, right, it is. So that, that all that is, is, that's what is being pointed to by all those abstractions. And I think it's very, and one thing that had not occurred to me, previous to hearing this from you, but will certainly be part of my armament from now on, is the fact that that's exactly the experience you get at the moment that you notice in the mindfulness training that you're distracted. And actually the reason for giving it, for labeling it anything is to call attention to it. But it hadn't occurred to me that it's possible to explicitly call attention to that moment as the experience of you. But, and I, that will now be added to my quiver of, <laughs> of arrows. <laughs> but, you see, what I've found in my own experience is that when first I got a glimpse of myself, and I didn't know what I was doing at the time, it was uh, only in retrospect that I was able to see what had happened. When the effects started to, you know, proliferate, and I, looking back to see what I had done, in that prison cell, in that bunk, that I came to understand what had happened and what I had done, and and from there on in, the the the, uh, the the rest of it became clear pretty quickly. But what I've found out, what I have found is that it, at that time, it took enormous effort and enormous. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it was strictly speaking necessary because it wasn't, strictly speaking, necessary. Because now I urge people to see that it's much easier than I thought it was. But for me at that time, but I do know that it's not natural for attention to go to the experience of knowingness or, as I say, you. It's not its natural resting place because it is in service to you. It's not, and, and, and being in service to you it is, is not, it doesn't serve you to have the only tool and the only power you have constantly referring back to the thing that it's serving in the first place. But what I've discovered over time, and you know, and it's not, it takes, it's nice to see it, it's nice to notice that sometimes it has a kind of a sweetness to it, a kind of a breath of fresh air. I call that goodness. Yeah. That's sweetness, what you call sweetness, I call goodness. Goodness, yeah. yeah it has not that. in contrast to badness. No, 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 no. Yes, no but yeah. just the, right. the, good, the pure goodness That's of, right. of being alive. That's right. And, uh, but it's not big. You know, it's not a big deal. And what I've found, a couple things that I've found. One is that I now see that the reason that we are on, not consciously aware of our actual nature all the time, for for one thing, is because it's not very interesting, and it's not boring. Boring, and it's and it's not very big, right? It really isn't much to you at all. But what I've found—it's not even a thing. It's so small. That's right. But what I have found, what I have found is that the truth is that you're always aware of the experience of you. That's the actual fact of it. You are always in your own awareness, unnoticed, unattended to, no need to attend to you, really, but that when the fear, the effects of the fear begin to bleed away, that that, that presence of you here is noticed more. I mean, it's known. It's not so much noticed as known, so that the perceived need to constantly refer back to it disappears, because here I am. I mean, here I am. Dogs don't have to think about being That's dogs. Right. That's right. We don't have to think about being That's human. That's right. Here I am. And it's obvious to me. So, 
I, but that's, I like that business about the fact that in mindfulness training that the noticing is the, is, is the moment when you kind of break open. Non-conceptual knowing that's experiential. Yeah, it's you. And it's you. Um, referencing your uh, technique of just one look, um, I have to tell you that sometimes I have to hear something more than once to be clear on it. Right. And... Um, in my personal meditation practice, uh, um, over the years, which had changed and gotten tweaked by different people at different times, uh, I received an instruction that I grappled with. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I couldn't get a understanding of it. I could repeat it, mm. and I could try to do it, but mm. I didn't understand it. And it was a very pithy instruction usually giving given to people that have established uh, stability strength and clarity through their shamatha practice and it was look into the face of awareness and I looked at that every which way that I could and I never felt that I had an understanding of it true and then my teacher I mentioned earlier the spring gave me the contemplation of uh, how do you feel? And I started to gain some insight and understanding of that earlier teaching, look into the face of awareness. But it wasn't until September, and I came here and talked with you, and you changed the words around a little bit, and said, how does it feel to be you, that it like came together, and I realized that the old teaching, look into the face of awareness, how does it feel how do you feel and what does it feel like to be you are all triangulating the very same experience or instruction. Yes, and, that's what they're attempting to and do. And that's to. what you did for me personally is you kind of brought teachings together that I had that I couldn't quite accomplish in having an understanding of and I remain deeply appreciative for you. And you know, it's all. I've, it's been clear to me, and I've spoken about this often, and probably will again and again. I know that sometimes I think that I say things too often, but then I know that from my own experience, that uh, people don't hear the first time usually, and and I know that I don't hear things the first time I hear them, so I keep doing it. But I'm pr absolutely convinced that. Uh, and not only within the realm of, uh, of um, sacred teachings and, and uh, you know, liberation teachings of the kind that we're talking about here, but in the realm of a lot of endeavors of human beings trying to find a solution to the problem, that there have been those over time who have stumbled, like I did, who have stumbled upon reality, who have stumbled upon the freedom from fear, but just like me, that happened in a context that was, the context itself was incapable of communicating what had actually happened. So that when people have tried to communicate to us what to do, they stumble and, and uh, their tongue gets tied. Because the context in which it occurred is not capable of communicating what actually occurred. And the, there's little left to do except try to use the, the language and the vernacular that we are familiar with to try to somehow judo people into a, a thing. It's like, like in Zen, you know, the Zen stick and stuff, trying to do something that'll just break through. Absolutely. All right. So that, and the only, the only difference here is that we finally stumbled upon a way to speak of it in ordinary human speech so that ordinary human beings who don't have the, the whatever, the insanity or the sanity or whatever it takes to be like you were or like I was and like really attack these things so that ordinary human beings can hear it and immediately uh, accomplish it. No, you've really, you've really succeeded in yeah. taking the pith essence and right. providing it on a secular basis. Uh, mindfulness training, a simple contemplation, 
um, and, and the idea of what it means to be human and to be uh, appreciate nowness. Right. And, and I see that what I am leading people to is the same that everybody else has tried to lead us through for all of those centuries. Okay, I see that clearly. All the other trappings right. are just uh, obstacles to, That's right. to, that create preconceptions and expectations. That's and right. um, uh, it's what's encased the dogma so that it can be passed on to somebody else. That's right. And maybe it was necessary at a time, but what was necessary to pass something on is also an obstacle to understanding it. Yes, that's right, exactly. And of course, in, in this, the, like these teachings go back for a very long time. They go back to a time when we thought that the earth was flat, when we thought that the sun revolved around the earth. I mean, really, that's the times they go back to so that it's not surprising that, two things are not surprising. One is it's not surprising that they have um, um, conditions in them that are conditioned by the, the, the level of ignorance of that time, right? And it's also true that, that because of that, it becomes necessary to do as you said, to encapsulate them and make them, to protect them and carry them forward from generation to generation. Individual liberation. Yeah. I mean, that's a very, very old teaching, yes. so, so tarpa. Yes. And uh, it had to be protected so it could be passed on right. to other people. But the way that was protected and passed on created obstacles and yes, expectations. That's, that's exactly right. And, that, and another thing that I see, and as I said on the opening meeting, I think the opening meeting, is that when we get this out, we're done. We don't have a teaching to protect and to pass on to the future generations. And we don't have that. What we have is an act where people can discover the reality of human existence for themselves and continue through the generations from parent to child and so forth and so on. So that we're not about creating that kind of an institution or that kind of a thing where the Dharma is protected and held and carried forward because we've, we've come to the end of the Dharma. We've come to the, the, the fulfillment of the Dharma and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. I also have to say about Trungpa Rinpoche. Please. I, uh, I say he was my first teacher in the spiritual realm. Actually, I suppose my first real teacher was probably, I'd have to say, Lenin, who <laughs> 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 uh, led me to Marx and Engels and, and, uh, and that whole philosophical realm. But my first teacher in this realm was Trungpa Rinpoche. And um, and I came upon him by sh uh, sheer accident. I, I, uh, well, I might as well tell this little story. I've told it before, but I love to hear stories about it. A lot of people haven't haven't heard it. I was in uh, in a prison in Colorado, a federal prison. They move you around all the time when you're. Now it's all different, but in those days it was that way. I was in a federal prison in Colorado and a friend of mine came to me and told me that there was a, this gorgeous uh, woman spiritual teacher who was from Mississippi and was beautiful and wonderful and she was coming to the prison to talk. That's, that's a woman you probably all have heard of, Gangaji. And she was coming to the prison to, uh, to visit with us. And he asked me if I wanted to come. Well. In those days, I wasn't really, I had no interest in anything spiritual. I liked playing tennis, and uh, I liked working on computers, and that was pretty much it, and waiting for me to be released or die. But the way he described her, I said, well, yeah, sure, I'll go, I'm in, let's go. And when the time came on the day of her uh, appearance in the prison, the time came to go and be with her, I had some kind of panic attack, um, you know, like I can put some spiritual spin on it, but really it was kind of a panic attack, and I, I sat down, I couldn't, I couldn't go. But I, now I was acquainted with a group of prisoners who were involved in these exotic Eastern teachings, 
And somebody else asked me if I wanted to come in, said there were some men who came in regularly from uh, Naropa, and uh, maybe I would want to come to that and see what that was about. And I said, yeah, okay. And of course, they were from Naropa, and they were uh, 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 Trungpa Rinpoche's uh, students. And the way they communicated the teaching was by reading, you know, reading the, uh, as it went on. And I was uh, shocked, because as they were reading these things, it was as if I always knew that. It wasn't anything, it was nothing I'd ever heard before, but it was nothing new to me either. It was like, yeah, yeah, of course, sure. So I started going there. Eventually they brought in a, a lama from, uh, a Tibetan lama that was coming through who gave me uh, refuge and bodhisattva vows at the same time. And I was a Buddhist. That was going to be what I was. I finally discovered I was a Buddhist. Ah, oh, at last I know what I am. I'm a Buddhist. And I started re reading Trungpa Rinpoche's books. And the first book I ever read was the book Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. Ditto. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in that book, one of the things that was in that book was an account of him meeting with a huge group of people. And, and uh, he came in late, and everybody was in the room. He came in late, and he sat down, and he said, okay, um, what was he? What was it he said? He said, everybody that's here. Oh, no, no, that's what he said. Everybody who has never been to a spiritual meeting before, please raise your hand. And a bunch of people raised their hand. And he said, okay, now please leave the room before you get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was so <laughs> beautiful that. Uh, so anyway, I love I love Rinpoche. I have Trump by Rinpoche. Thank the you. other thing was the blue pancake too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the other thing was when asked what his experience was when he finally, whatever, got enlightened or whatever, he said it was as if a, this guy turned, as if a big blue pancake fell on my head, and I thought that was pretty cool and uh, didn't. <laughs> Didn't leave any room for too much mischief there, right? <laughs> so, I'm very fond of Trunk by Rinpoche, and uh, very happy to have had uh, exposure to him. And, and as you probably can tell, my, my demeanor and my presentation of things is, has been uh, uh, somewhat shaped by my experience with Trunk by Rinpoche. Well, I continue to um, work towards his aspirations myself, and what you're doing is absolutely <coughs> aligned with how I understand those aspirations. Okay. Thank good. you. So there. So uh, there. Anytime you want somebody to come up and talk to you and nobody, just say, hey, Jim, come on up again. Okay. <laughs> so there, I've made the confession to all about my Buddhist, my shameful Buddhist past. I have more shameful things than that in my past, however, so. Okay, anybody else want to talk? Sasha. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, when I can I'm tell. When I'm here. Yeah. But it's like when I'm not here, that's the problem. Oh, really? Yeah. We'll stay here then. Well, I did that for months, years ago. I mean, stayed here. But it's like being in this energy and being in this community. Um, I had the same experience when I first went to a Tibetan Buddhist monastery, actually. It was in Nepal. And every morning, Except it was worse, I mean, because every morning when the teacher would come in, within minutes of him starting talking, I'd fall asleep every morning. And it's like here, I feel also kind of knocked out. It's like my, the mind gets knocked out, which is a huge blessing. But unfortunately, it comes back when I go home. 
Now see, that's not a huge blessing. If the mind gets knocked out and blocked, that's part of the symptoms of the fear. The fear doesn't want you to hear this stuff. No, I hear it. You, I hear we're not it. trying to put you to sleep. Tr truly, I'm not trying to put you to sleep. And if you go to sleep, it must be, and since other people don't go to sleep, no, I'm not going to sleep. I just feel very relaxed yeah, and very safe and very peaceful oh, that's and good. very calm. That's good. But as that's opposed not what you to say. any worry or fear or anxiety. Okay. And? And. So it's good to be that's here. That's what I feel. Yeah. So that's okay. what I feel here. But it doesn't last in my life. What doesn't last? The Tell peace, me. the calm, the. Um, oh, lack yeah. of fear and last and f lack of fear and anxiety about the future, finances, you know, survival, all of, all of that. Well, you know, survival is worthy of some attention. I'm not sure, you say, whether what you're describing to me is because let me tell you this, okay? How long have you and I? We, we've been knowing each other since way back in the days when we were, 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 met in that house in, uh, in downtown Ojai. At John's? Yeah, John Nassie's. Yeah, at John Nassie's, right. We, we've, been, we've been together for many years, right? You've been coming, falling asleep for sometimes, not no, falling asleep. No, only lately falling Other, asleep. No, no, I you didn't... used to fall asleep a lot. No. Oh, yeah. Not me. <laughs> not Cross me. <laughs> Cross my heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't remember that. <laughs> and Sasha? <laughs> Sasha? Maybe because I was asleep. Yeah. Yeah. Sa yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sasha, the difference in you, in your demeanor, in your, in your presence, in your, your engagement and, and, and conversation, communication back and forth, since those days to now, is like night and day. The change in you is absolutely obvious from out here. Oh, when I, from when I did that weekly retreat with you in that big house down at um, Kenyatta, Kenyatta. Whatever, yeah. yeah. All that time. The change in you is so apparent and so obvious that it's perplexing to me to hear you come back and say, well, I still have this, I still have that. Of course, why wouldn't you be anxious about the future? Anxiety is not necessarily um, pathological. You know, anxiety is not necessarily pathological. There's pathological anxiety, which is pretty much constant and always there and always ready to, you know, go into curl into a ball and worry about things and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then there's anxiety, which is more, it's sometimes difficult to tell the difference between expectation and anxiety. There's anxiety that's more like, what's going to happen and how is it going to happen? and and a feeling of being alive, actually, you know? The well, I think that it has a lot to do with fear that was implanted in my childhood. Oh, sure. From both it of my takes parents time. That was, you know, huge. But, it, and now it's like I worry about other things. Yeah. But, it, but it's also a lot that was implanted when I was a very young child. Yes, of course. And, but um, listen to me. Yeah. But it really doesn't affect you, does it, when it happens? Tell the truth. Well, it affects my mind. Well, you know. And well, sometimes my body, because then I can't sleep. But sometimes that doesn't matter. Yeah, right. I mean, sometimes I can't sleep too. Um, sometimes yeah. I wake up worrying about money. Um, yeah, I want to uh, ask you, know, you this. Uh, what do you think this about the idea that all fear comes from self grasping? If you're not I think wanting it's or desiring I think it's anything, thing grasping for anything, there's no fear. No. Listen, the problem is not psychological. It's not something that you can be talked out of or some understanding can produce a, a result that frees you of it. It's not psychological. The problem has nothing to do with grasping or not grasping. Grasping or not grasping is symptoms. They're not the problem. They're symptoms of the problem. Mm. What's the problem? The problem is the fear of life. And the fear of life is, my, my guess is, that the fear of life is long gone from you. And that what you're experiencing now in these episodes is just a, a lengthy, drawn-out period of recovery because of the 
deep wound that you've received over your life. But a lot of it's gone. Yeah, I know. And the rest of it will go as time goes on. These things are nothing that you need to concern yourself with. But if when there's an episode like this that arises, just do what I suggest. Notice that it doesn't need your attention, mm -hmm. right? It really doesn't. Change the attention. And then move your attention to your breath. Mm -hmm. And by starting to do that, it'll take some time for the results to show themselves, yeah. but they will show. And well, you'll I... f find yourself to be much more skillful than you think you are at handling things like that. Well, I've noticed if I change my attention and go watch a movie or um, just go on the computer doing my emails and going doing stuff like that, it works because that's yeah. simply changing my attention. Yeah. It's like changing the channel. Yeah, and but that's it fine. It's not a permanent fix. It only works. Right. After, the the permanent know, fix permanent has already fix. happened. It has. Yes, it has. It's yeah. just that it's like you know. I used to have warts on my finger. I had three big warts on this finger. And what happened? And and I hated those warts. Right? They got in my way. They caught on my clothes. They just were terrible. And uh, and then they went away. They just went away. And I, yeah, they just went away. Wow. And I didn't even realize that they had gone away for a while. And I, you know, and my relationship to my finger remained pretty much the same as it had been with the warts, except that the warts weren't there anymore. Hmm. It's like that with this stuff. These are like warts, and they're going to fall off. I promise you, they will fall off. Now, that's really moving, encouraging. Moving your attention deliberately, right? Yeah. Moving your attention deliberately from its interest in these anxiety feelings and mm -hmm. things of that nature. Moving your attention deliberately away from that is is extremely powerful in hastening them on their way, because they feed on your attention. That's their energy. Right? Mm -hmm. But even better than to move your attention to a distraction, right? like the computer or the TV, which is perfectly okay, really. It'll do the job in the end, because you're not attending to what doesn't need attending to. But what's even better is to deliberately move your attention to your breath. And the reason that's even better is because it's not something that is something you can kind of get get lost in and there and you're like there thereby forget about the whole thing. It's something where you are actually in control of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're actually mm -hmm. in control of it, and you can see you're in control mm -hmm. of it, and that will will multiply over time. The effects of that will multiply in the way that merely avoiding it by turning attention to a distraction will. I promise. So try that. It will multiply what? It will multiply the, the effectiveness okay. of your relationship with these things over time in a way that f merely finding something distracting will not. Finding something distracting is good. I don't have any problem with it. Mm -hmm. Moving your attention deliberately away from that to anything is good. Mm -hmm. But moving it to you to the breath, to something real, present, and alive, like your breath, mm -hmm. is, uh, gives you uh, much more power. Robert Adams said that vipassana is basically using the mind and therefore it really is a dead end and doesn't really work. I, uh, well, I don't care about vipassana. I don't care about Robert Adams. What I care about is you. Okay? <laughs> and I tell you okay. that if you will just move your attention, from the things that trouble you to your breath, that you will find, you will quickly find uh, much more than you think you will. Thanks. Okay, I'll try that. Uh, but by the way, um, Trungpa's book, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, is the first Eastern book I read too. There you go. Read it in the read, read, in, the, read it in the 60s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never met him, but anyway. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Yeah. You look so good. You know, really, I'm, you're, uh, I like, I like it that, I like what's been happening to you. Thanks. Okay. All right. You can put that on the chair. <clears throat> Anybody else?
put my head on the chopping block here. And tell me your name again first. Mark. Mark, right. <laughs> Mark, of course. I was thinking about you earlier at lunch, actually. <laughs> I'm going to interject something into the community, and I'm sure it'll be rejected roundly, immediately. And that is, and I'm really trying to take an honest look at this, not to agree just because it's easier to agree, not to disagree because it's habitual to disagree. This whole idea of the fear of life, I see that as a symptom in that there's something deeper that gives rise to the fear of life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that I see as what I... What was that? Everybody oh. just rejected it. <laughs> see, I told you I'd be roundly rejected. <laughs> What do you see it as being, then? I, I see that fundamental ignorance of our what, our, I, what we really are is the fundamental cause that gives rise to the fear of life. And I thought up a little, uh, what's it called, a uh, metaphor when I was sitting there. And if you just bear with me, and I'll be quick about it. Imagine a world where people are told, do not go out in the rain because we dissolve if we're wet by rainwater. You know, like the Wizard of Oz, the witch. She was very afraid of the rain. So you've been taught that. So now you have the fear of rain, a.k.a. the fear of life. No, that is not the cause. The cause is you have fundamental ignorance. You cannot be hurt by the rain. That's the fundamental ignorance that gives rise to the fear of life. This is what I want to bring to the community. I believe that fundamental ignorance is the core, the absolute essence, and from that arises the fear of life. And that is what the, I considered to be what the Zen masters were pointing to when they talked about true enlightenment, that we are born with fundamental ignorance. And when we see what's always been there, because I had an experience when I was 18, in the fundamental shock of it was that I had always been experiencing it. That enlightenment is something we always experience, we always have, even in our deepest misery and darkness, we've always been experiencing our true self. And at that point, nothing could hurt me. Even my misery, my depression, my darkness, I could not be hurt. There, at that moment, the fear of life, it did not remain. It was just a, a, a flash brought about by enormous exertion. I had, was 18, I was in a traditional Japanese Zen monastery, and they pushed me within an inch of my life in midwinter, freezing, with a thin cotton robe at 15 degrees. And at one point I decided the only way through was to completely surrender, to die. And I went into this death, and when I emerged, I had a moment where I realized this. And this is what I've been trying to get back to, and perhaps it's hurting me, trying to get rid of this ignorance to see clearly what has always been. Then the fear of life goes. Now I, f I have this feeling, and I want to believe it, because I want to be helped in any way, that now it, I'm told, no, it's the fear of life that's the problem. And if you, if you look at yourself, well, if you look at yourself and the fear of life goes away, the fear of life wasn't the cause. That was a symptom, too. It's the looking at yourself and the which clears away the fundamental ignorance that allows for the fear of life to shrivel up. So that, that's all I had to say. What, and what do you suppose is the cause of this fundamental ignorance? Well, if this would be just taking it on others' words. They say when we came into this life, we were already ignorant because we've been cycling through birth and death and rebirth and through the bardo since beginningless times. So already when we're born, we have the imprint of fundamental ignorance. That's why we're born. So what's the cause of it? Birth? The fundamental, oh, you, if we go back, back? What's the cause of it? What causes ignorance? Ignorance is not a thing. It's a negative, yes. it's a negativity. It's, an, it's, an, it's a misidentification. It's an absence. No, no, it's not misidentification. Ignorance is the absence of knowledge. That's what it is, it's an absence. It's not the presence of anything. So what causes it? Now, I say that the fear of life causes it. That's what I say. I also say 
that I don't know that that's the case for sure, right? I don't know that the fear of life is the cause of it for sure, but I'm pretty convinced of it for myself, that the fear of life is the cause of that ignorance, and the looking is the dispelling of that ignorance in a way that is beneath the level of conscious awareness. That's what I say. The fear of life dispels the ignorance by, by dispelling, by dissolving the layer of fearfulness that covers up the reality of our nature. That's what I say. And I have, like you, I have never been in a Japanese monastery where it got up and, you know, in the cold yeah. and stuff. But I have spent quite a lot of time investigating these teachings and, and trying as best I could in the past to uh, enact them in my own practice. I have had phenomenal experiences as a result of spiritual practice. I had a year, a full year, in which the, the, the stones sang to me, in which I found a teacher in a dead baby bird, in which uh, I just see, I can't even describe the the um, the bliss that afflicted me. I say afflicted me now, right? I spent a year like that, and then I spent, and then that collapsed, as it always does. That collapsed and left me bereft, entirely hopeless, terrible, wanting to. But I'd, I'd rather die than be the way I was then. And in the in the course of that, I ended up with this act. I took this act during a period of trying to rid myself of any hope. And I stumbled upon this act. And what I see, my, what I see very clearly, is that it is true, it is true, that ignorance is the fundamental issue, in that there is this personality, this person, this collection of psychological structures by means of which I experience and engage with my life, that are corrupted and uh, tainted and uh, contaminated by the unexamined assumption that there's something wrong here, something profoundly wrong that mere thinking about it isn't going to fix. It's the kind of thing that has gotten the name of original sin, a burden, a curse that we carry. Uh, that whole array of personality, all those psychological structures, are mechanical. They're not alive. They're not alive in the sense that I am. Even now, in the array of personal structures and psychological structures by means of which I relate to you and communicate with you and hear you, they're not alive. They're like little algorithms that have, have come into being to help me be able to, to relate to you and to be relate to the world as a whole. Now, the ignorance of my actual nature is gone. I, I mean, it, the ignorance is gone. I am constant. I am without interruption, totally clear on me. Yeah. Right? I don't have to refer to it. I don't have to constantly wonder about it or worry about it. It's just that it's no longer a, this pit of ignorance that, uh, that is at the heart of things. But I, I'm certain that ignorance was the problem, but ignorance had a cause. And it wasn't a cause of going through bardos and past lives and things of that nature. It's a cause that is very human and present. It's, it's not something that has to be explained by, you know, like when we thought that the, that the world was the center of the universe. Yeah. A whole lot of stuff had to be explained in order to make that hold together and eventually it fell apart. Doesn't mean that the stuff that was necessary to make that hold together were wrong exactly. They were just the best we could do. But now we've discovered that whatever the cause is, there is a cause, a human cause, to this ignorance. The ignorance which, which is what allows this misery to constantly happen. If we have a clear understanding of our nature, then that craziness doesn't occur because we don't 
have the sense that our fundamental yeah. nature is at risk here, yeah, risk. Yeah. right? And what did that was the looking. What did that was the looking. And the looking, and I believe that it's exactly as we have suspected over the ages that the problem is ignorance. The problem is ignorance as to our true nature. But the solution is to bring the, the only means we have of actually experiencing things, which is attention, which is focus of attention, by bringing that capacity in direct contact with the reality that it is trying so desperately to protect and seeing that it needs no protection. But that that, that switch occurs way below the level of conscious uh, awareness of the, you know, conscious consciousness. Way below that it appears and it's instantaneous. And what's not instantaneous is the the falling away and the restructuring of the personality, which is the only thing we see, you know, about what we are and how we relate to things and so forth. That takes time to accomplish. That and it can, it can cause, you know, there can be difficulties, there can be confusion, there can be fear, there can be all kinds of things during that recovery. But once that initial touch is made, the ignorance is dispelled, gone, over with. And the, the end is sure, the end is certain, and the end is the collapse and falling away of all of the neurotic and hurtful and, and stupid things that we've done to try to keep ourselves safe from life itself. And they just fall away, fall away. Nothing more needs to be done to them. You can't, you can't talk yourself out of that, you know? You can't, you can't talk yourself out of that stuff. You just have to wait for it to go. So, I think it's true that ignorance is the root cause, but I think ignorance itself, there's no reason for you to be ignorant except that there's this thing there that prevents you from knowing the actuality of your nature. And that thing is, and I believe it comes, I believe it comes with a birth trauma, and which is a much, you know, that's like human, right? It's not, it doesn't require resorting to all kinds of... Uh, uh, metaphysical speculation. I believe it's the birth trauma. I believe that when, uh, not everybody suffers it either. You know, there are, there are cases where people just don't, I, I think, or don't, aren't afflicted with that from the very beginning. Maybe birth and water has an effect, you know, effect on diminishing that and so forth. But think about it. Here we are. We are in the womb for nine months. Nine months. For a goodly part of that nine months, at least the last trimester, we're pretty much all complete. All of our parts are assembled and everything. Our brain's there and everything. And so that we're, for nine months we're floating in warmth, comfort, never hungry, never thirsty, rocking with the mother's uh, bodily movements, hearing the mother's heartbeat, the mother's breath. That's all there is to life. That's life. There's no separate uh, psychology formed that, that examines it and, and, and sees itself apart from it and so forth. It's just that, me, alive, warm, comfortable. And then all of a sudden, I am expelled from the womb, expelled from life itself, it seems, into this gigantic madness of lights and noise and cutting me and cold and wet and Everything that happens when we're, I don't even remember what happens when you're born, but it ain't, it can't be a pleasant experience. And what I think is, and this again, I think this, it's not necessarily true. It just is, it's, it's good enough to explain things in its own terms, right? I think that what happens is that in that moment of expulsion from the womb, we shrink. Consci our consciousness kind of shrinks on itself. And, to protect itself. And that when that initial movement of shrinking occurs, that sets the context for the way in which the psychology develops from then on out. It sets it as a context of the assumption that there's a lot here to be really scared of. A lot here to be really scared of. And I've got to be really careful. And as, as I 
as I grow and I learn to talk and read and all those things, I realize that there's even much more to be scared of and, and to be careful about than I could have imagined when I first popped out of the womb. So that everything I learn reinforces that relationship with life that holds life to be fundamentally threatening yeah. and fundamentally wrong. And when all of this holds together when we see what the looking does, the looking brings that attention, which is our only thing we can do voluntarily, right? Brings that tool, which is the only tool we have, in direct contact with the reality that it's protecting from life itself. And just that contact destroys the ignorance, destroys that whole, whole array, uh, that whole basis, that fundamental assumption that is the basis for the disease psychology. So it basically it destroys the view that you could be helped or harmed by anything. Yes, right. It's obvious once you see it. But it's not obvious to me now, as I talk to you, I'm no. still in the context of yes, the fear right. of life. Right. Yes, right. Well, you may not be, right? The, con you, the ignorance may be gone, but still and all, the only way you have of experiencing and relating to it's what's happening to you is the diseased mechanism. And as that mechanism begins to fall away, and you'll notice it, you'll notice that things, wow, I didn't, I didn't expect to feel that about that, you know, things like that, yeah. right? You'll notice that as it happens. And as that begins to fall away, what's occurring at the same time, because it's the nature of being human, is a regeneration of the psychological structures needed to relate to life and to one another and so forth. So it would be correct in saying that the <clears throat> fear causes the ignorance and then the dissipation of the ignorance causes the fear to fall away. Yeah, it so it's causes the like effects, the symptoms, yes, right. Causes the symptoms to fall away. And as the symptoms begin to fall away, healthy new tissue, if you will, personality tissue begins to be generated and in a, in a, on a foundation that's not crippled by the ignorance as to the actual nature of your presence here. And it's perfectly understandable where all these ideas came from, but they came from a long time ago. And we've been trying for 5,000 years, for 5,000 years to make sense of things and to be able to use those ideas in a way that will provide me with freedom and liberation from fearfulness and anxiety. And some, some manage to do that within that context. Not many, but some. But there's so many other things we've tried too. We've tried getting rich. I suspect that some get rich and in the course of getting rich find some space where they actually get a taste of what it feels like to be them and they get better. They get better. You know, you hear about rich people giving away all their money. You see guys like Tom Hanks, who apparently is a really uh, clear and settled human being, right? Fame, we seek fame. Some folks have probably, in the seeking of fame, stumbled upon their actual nature and found uh, satisfaction from it. It's reasonable to assume that all of those pursuits that have that we have taken to our own, seeking money, seeking sex, seeking fame, seeking uh, power, seeking whatever, that all of those things have had success somewhere for somebody in order for us to persist in uh, running those things again and again in the human sphere. But they're not reliable. Seeking money is not a reliable way in fact, it often causes more trouble to the individual than it causes help to the individual. Seeking fame is not the way, similarly. Seeking uh, any of those things, and nor is seeking enlightenment effective for most of the people who enter into that realm. The difference between this and all of those efforts is that this will work for anybody. It'll work for anybody, and you don't need anything except what's already here. 
You don't need to acquire something new. You don't need to get rid of something old. You don't need to understand something. You don't need to abandon understanding. You don't need to believe something. You don't need to abandon belief. All you have to do is look. And then watch what happens as the, as the symptoms of the disease begin to fall away. So it's not that I exactly disagree with the utterances of the ancient uh, uh, sacred teachings and so forth. I see exactly how it is that they have come to say the things they say, trying with all of their heart to communicate what has actually happened to them, which is just this mere fact. And this is why the, the, the ancient practice of self-inquiry has had such long legs throughout history. It, and not only in India, in Greece and, and uh, Japan and China and other places too. The, the, the rubric of self-inquiry has very long legs and it has a, a vast array of, of uh, practices like neti neti and all those things are all in that rubric of self-inquiry because of an intuitive understanding that what's the problem here is a misunderstanding of my actual nature. But it comes from a time when our understanding of things and our ability to cl be clear about what had happened was much different than it is now. And now we have 5,000 years of experience with what mostly is a failure, not for everybody, but mostly for, if looked at as for humanity itself, 5,000 years of experience with this failure that should inform us and make us look elsewhere. But with the understanding that there must be something there, otherwise it wouldn't have lasted so long. But this is the thing. You're human. You're here. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> you're human, you're here, get over it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, you're very yeah, that welcome. Was helpful. And, that and was pay attention helpful. to what's happening because you've, you've looked, I know that. Okay. You pay attention as time goes on and go to the forums. You don't have to do anything, yeah. just read what's there. Read what people are saying and what, what, what help is there, you know, and, and you'll see. Thank you. Okay, you're very welcome. <clears throat> that was fun. <laughs> huh? Fear and ignorance, just like the chicken and the egg. That's it. Yeah, which came first? And I, you know, and I think it's pretty obvious to me that, like, certainly when we take birth, there's we are the only thing we're really aware of, other than the comfort and which is not seen to be separate from us, right? The experience of being in the womb is not separate from us when we're in the womb. But that's all we know, that's all we have. And there's no ignorance about our nature, there's no question about our nature, it's just what we are. The ignorance happens when the bright lights hit us and it turns out that everything we thought about ourselves, of course, using thought in a really you know, loose form. Everything we thought we about her. Yes, it, it, it turns out to be not true because look at all this stuff. This isn't the way I. I this isn't what I. I didn't sign up for this, for God's sake. Okay. That's it. We're going to go now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love you guys. <laughs> Okay, I'll see you tomorrow morning, and uh, sleep well, enjoy your rest, and, and enjoy your demons should they come in the night. <laughs> see if you can't just look at your breath, which will never hurt you. <laughs>